we've got a great, great lineup for you this morning as well. Uh, we, I shared yesterday that there were three partners responsible for putting on this summit, and we're going to shine a spotlight right now on the second partner to this morning, ATTC. And to help us learn a little bit more about that, I want to tell you about our next speaker. For nearly 25 years, ATTC has improved the quality of addictions treatment and recovery services by facilitating partnerships, providing training, and responding to the emerging needs of the field. Lori Crom, MS, is a program director in the Collaborative, Collaborative to Advance Health Services at the University of Missouri-Kansas City School of Nursing and Health Services. Lori is a leader in grant development and implementation, having received several multi-million dollar federal awards. She's the director of the SAMHSA-funded Addiction Technology Transfer Center Network Coordinating Office and the PI co-director of the CDC-funded National Capacity Building Assistance for a High-Impact HIV Prevention Resource Center. Lori's expertise is in building and strengthening inter-organizational networks to deepen the impact of public health collaborations. She's a lifelong learner in transformative education, facilitated leadership and technology transfer, and a recognized leader in substance use disorder treatment field. Here to tell us more about the ATTC network, please welcome Lori Crum. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. The Addiction Technology Transfer Center Network has been funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration since 1993, so we are approaching our 25th anniversary. ATTCs develop and strengthen the specialized behavioral health care and primary health care workforces that provide substance use disorder treatment and recovery support services in the United States and also abroad. ATTC's work at the local, regional, and national levels to improve the quality and effectiveness of services for people with substance use and co-occurring disorders based on known evidence. The ATTC program is in a transition period. We are ending our current funding cycle and we are about to, to begin a new funding cycle. And in this transition, you will see both changes to the structure and function of the ATTC network. In the past, ATTC activities have been devoted mostly to trainings, workshops, product development. While all of this is still important, the work of the ATTCs is going to be shifting to put a greater emphasis on implementation of evidence-based practices and continuous quality improvement. We're excited for what's to come and we look forward to working with many of you in this room in the years ahead. There are a number of my ATTC colleagues here in the room. ATTCers, will you just stand for a second? Stand up if you're an ATTCer. If you have any questions, about the changes coming to the ATTC network, please feel free to reach out to any of those that you just saw standing in the room. We're happy to talk to you about this uh, pretty significant change in our scope. And on behalf of my colleagues in the ATTC network, I want to thank you for attending the National Cannabis Summit. We're proud to be a planning partner of this one-of-a-kind conference and to bring you the latest science regarding cannabis. Now I'd like to take a moment to give a few thank yous. First, I want to thank the Hilton Foundation, who provided funding to support the prevention track of this conference. We appreciate their support. Also, a special thank you to our program planning committee, and especially the co-chairs of the committee, Beth Rutowski from the Pacific Southwest ATTC, and Linda Frazier from AHP. Of the committee are listed on the inside back cover of your program. 
They really worked tirelessly to put together a conference agenda that honored our commitment to holding a neutral forum based on science. If you are on the program planning committee, could you go ahead and stand? Okay, can we have a round of applause for our Finally, there are several representatives from SAMHSA in the room. I want to truly thank our fund, our ATTC funder, SAMHSA, for supporting the ATTC's participation as a planning partner in this conference. So thank you to those of you from SAMHSA who are in the room. Now, I am honored to introduce this morning's panelists whose combined state and federal regulatory experience is unmatched. Dr. John Carnevale has more than 30 years experience in drug policy, criminal justice, and healthcare policy. He served three administrations at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, where he helped formulate the National Drug Control Strategy. His firm, Carnevale Associates, focuses on policy research and evaluation, strategic planning and regulatory reform, including the liberalization of marijuana laws. Dr. Carnavali serves on NIDA's National Drug Advisory Council and provides expert testimony for members of Congress, state and local governments, and international organizations. Rick Garza joined the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board then known as the Liquor Control Board, in 1997. Before being appointed director in 2013, Rick served as deputy director and legislative and tribal liaison. He oversaw the retooling of Washington's liquor control policy and was honored for his work by the National Council of State Liquor Administrators, which inducted them, which inducted him into their Hall of Fame. Today, Rick oversees Colorado's comprehensive systems of growing, processing, and retailing marijuana for recreational use. Louis Kosky was director of the Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division during the legalization of marijuana. He played a pivotal role in building the first agency in the world to implement medical and retail marijuana policy. Louis helped develop regulations, launch an inventory tracking system, and address legal and personnel issues. He is co-founder and senior director of Friedman and Kosky, which helps governments apply strategic approaches to implementing marijuana policy. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed panelists. So I go back to my boss at the OMB, 
the political appointee and I sort of walked through what I learned. And she says, well, what, what are we going to do? And I said, I don't know. Let's, let's take the advice from Nancy Reagan and just say no. And uh, so that was my beginning. Was, you know, a lot of what they were asking for was what I thought the limited research back then said was not effective, which is to really focus on drug interdiction, stopping drugs from coming into the United States. And again, the drugs were one, cocaine. Um, I then went to uh, uh, the Office of National Drug Control Policy when it was first created. Bill Bennett was the first drug czar. This is going back 27 years uh, ago. And uh, we wrote a strategy strictly around the topic of cocaine. And that strategy had to come out in September of 89. And we're all looking at the data, and we finally asked our boss, you know, what do we say about marijuana? And so our boss walks down the hall and comes back and reports. He said, well, we met with the director, and he said, well, when was the last time you heard about a marijuana-related drive-by shooting? And so we all just scratched the word marijuana from the strategy. It wasn't a concern to ODCP at that time. It wasn't even on the radar. Um, so, so that's sort of the background in terms of my involvement in drug policy. I stayed until 2000, worked for a lot of drug czars, and uh, worked on strategies and policies. Um, this first slide, um, the reality. 63% um, of Americans live in the states have been medical or recreation. Uh, we know that. That's a population value-based estimate. Um, the reason I like to show this chart is a lot of people still want to debate whether we're for or against legalization. Uh, I think that train's left the station. The country has spoken. It's made up its mind. 63% of the population is, is living in states, and we need to do something about that in terms of regulating it uh, and protecting the public health. Uh, and so I've been taking that approach as a, a former bureaucrat. Um, I think, you know, once the country has made a, expressed an opinion of its policy, uh, then we have to worry about implementation. And so we have eight states in D.C., and we have 28 states in D.C., which is really um, the 63%, uh, where we have... Uh, this done deal. And, and so the question becomes, how did we get here? Um, this chart may be a little bit complicated. The top line is really the one that's the most important. It's sort of a polling about marijuana legalization, what Americans think. Um, and so with this one, um, if you look at this, uh, in, the, in the middle section, there's a very flat, the top line is very flat. It's around 10% from about uh, the late or late 70s all the way up to around 2000. Uh, that's 10% of Americans, roughly, who thought we should engage in uh, legalization. Uh, that's when I was in government. And so concerns about marijuana legalization simply weren't on, not, were not on the radar. Um, and when I left government, uh, things started to change. As uh, John Kelly said yesterday, there was a war on the war on drugs that really started in earnest, I think, around 1995. A lot of, and John Cockins pointed out yesterday, three billionaires really helped finance the Drug Policy Alliance movement to start to medicalize marijuana. And as you can see from 2000 on, public opinion changed dramatically, as did uh, uh, the passage of, of laws around medical, at least at, over this period, and then starting in 12 with, with recreational. Um, so we know all the reasons why people think the drug war failed. I won't get into those. You know them as well. We heard a lot about those. Uh, yesterday, but you can see now that uh, the trend is going up, and I'm not hearing anything in the media, uh, in, the, in the polling, that suggests this trend is going to reverse itself. And so we're here for this reason. Uh, we're being agnostic, we're being practical, we're not taking sides, we're trying to solve a problem about regulation. Um, and so again, here's where we are with recreational marijuana. Um, we all know who these states are. Uh, the, uh, the two gentlemen on my left were the states that had to deal with uh, regulating marijuana from the beginning um, uh, when Colorado and Washington passed their, their laws. Um, so now one of my things that's sort of a, a little pet peeve was we, we use the term recreational marijuana. Um, some of the federal agencies I, I work for through my company don't want us to use that word recreational. It sounds like we're going to a theme park, and we're going to have a lot of fun. I mean, we use that word recreation. But in my mind, we all use that word. It's, it's been branded. It's a term. And so I continue to use it unless I'm writing reports for my clients in, in the federal communities. They talk about uh, marijuana for personal use. Now, 
I keep thinking, well, why else would people buy it? It's for personal use, but anyways. Um, so I'm going to keep referring to it as recreational marijuana until the media changes it, rebrands it, and uh, uh, we'll go from there. So again, the majority of the states live in, in uh, look, the majority of the population live in states where um, we have either medical, or recreational, or both. So now, um, my involvement in terms of regulations. A couple of years ago, a friend of mine, Patrick Murphy, who used to work at the Office of Management and Budget, is now a professor in San Francisco and works uh, as a vice president of the Public Policy Institute of California, came to me and said, you know, California may be about to legalize marijuana. We should be giving them advice, some best practice ideas on what to do uh, with regard to that. And so we put together uh, a study and we interviewed a lot of people, including these two gentlemen to my left, uh, to get advice on best practices and what to advise uh, the state of California. Um, so let me get into that a little bit. So and I'll tell you what we recommended. In a nutshell, the report we produced was released in Sacramento about a year ago. Uh, there was a room full of this bit, about 400 people who were staff, legislators who wanted to hear what we had to say. Um, and we had uh, Rick and Lewis on the panel with us to talk about the findings. The good news is they didn't see the report until the night before, and lucky for us, they happened to agree with the recommendations. We forgot to ask them if they agreed to talk about setting ourselves up for a bad press conference, but anyways, uh, it worked out. So our recommendations were, were three. Um, begin with a relatively tight market, um, a nice, tight regulatory strategy to create a single market. Um, remember California medicalized in 96. That market was unregulated for 20 years. Um, and so we thought, if you're going to get into regulations, combine these markets, make it a single one, um, and move forward. Second, build in the capacity to change. What that means is flexibility. Uh, we thought the last thing anyone needs in this age of uncertainty about what this market and the industry is going to look like when it emerges is, is uh, inflexibility, where if I want to change a regulation, I have to go to the legislature and wait a year to walk through a process to get things done. Um, we wanted regulators to have the power to quickly move and change things. Uh, through a, a more expeditious process. And finally, being researchers, we said, look, nobody knows how this new policy is going to work out. We need to build data systems at the state level, also at the federal level, and we need to build in the capacity to conduct research because chances of getting things right the first time are kind of, kind of low. So you need to have a feedback mechanism in terms of knowledge and research and get that going as part of the initial, initial setup. So for California, our advice was, you know, in terms of the regulated market, start with a limited number of licenses. Uh, and engage in what we economists call horizontal integration. In other words, have licensing at different levels of the production process, so cultivation, processing, and so on. Uh, in other words, don't have a retail shop own the entire supply chain down to the cultivation. It's easier, we thought, based on what we've learned from dealing uh, with, the, with the two states at that point, this made more sense. Limit size of cultivation, make sure that you have controls on how big the grows are so you don't have one big firm overwhelming others. Uh, product testing, a lot of worry that we heard about from yesterday from pesticides, fertilizers, and, and their effect on health. And uh, in California at the point, at this point it was a drought and there was a lot of concern about environmental concerns and water use. They still exist, of course. And so uh, this is what we had basically highlighted. And we made a really clear note about a trade-off. Remember the cold memo said you can't have diversion, uh, you need to somehow get rid of the illegal market as a goal. Well, if you start with our recommendations, it's going to be a while before the illegal, the illegal market disappears. And a, a little small issue in there that we raised is the issue of home grows. Patrick and I simply oppose it. We think this is a silly idea, but states have passed these laws. Um, as an industry is being developed and emerging, we couldn't understand how I could have six plants with three uh, are ready to go and three maturing um, and, uh, and have that sort of in the background while, while we're trying to create a legal market. Uh, six plants is a lot of marijuana for an individual to have and you know, other states have even larger numbers. And we thought it would create problems for enforcement and uh, other issues and we were really were speaking out against that, um, apparently the deaf ears, but um, no surprise there. So. Um, Finally, on the regulatory framework, this is made look a little complicated, um, but what it does show, I think it reflects a little bit of what both Kilmer said yesterday, that there are a lot of decisions that have to be made, and in, in this framework, we had five basic areas. Um, if you've ever read 
regulatory rules like in Washington and Colorado, the, the, the pages are this thick and there's lots of categories and we needed in a report to, to figure out a way to, to summarize in a sort of nice, succinct way. So we talk about cultivation, production, and process, and now each of those can be their own sections. And we said in, in reviewing and talking to focus, folks, we heard things like the goals might, might be to manage cultivation, limit to supply, availability, limit diversion. You always want to use that word because of the coal memo made it very clear, the feds made it very clear that they don't want drugs going from the legal to the illegal markets. Um, the second area was sales, consumption, and possession. It was really about retail sales and use. Um, there was a lot of discussion and concern about limiting access to use. You can get into all kinds of things around that. Advertising, packaging, the list is very long. Lots of decisions for states to make. Um, taxes and finance, um, Pat Ogilvy is here for, to talk tomorrow. And he's the expert on this. But uh, we thought this tax structure should be simple. I can't wait to hear what, he, uh, what his advice might be. Um, because having taxes at different levels of production gets very complicated in terms of the regulatory process. So we thought, keep it simple. Uh, public health and safety, everybody goes immediately to the issue of drunk driving and marijuana impairment and what does that mean, how do we regulate that. But there's also concern about we don't know uh, what the extent of abuse will be, problem drug use or marijuana use, uh, addiction, what that's going to mean for the demand for treatment. These are all unknowns that we have to worry about. So there's concern about that. And finally, in the issue of governance, um, really meaning uh, the government, the, the state has to somehow manage this regulatory system. How big should the regulatory group be? be? How is it funded? Um, how does it operate? Um, how does it manage and enforce the regulations in the state? How effective will they be as a function, of course, how big the staffing is for that? Um, and of course, they also get into a lot of detail about governances getting that feedback mechanism that I love so much and others do, which is data and information for research so we can understand if we made good decisions. We don't know because we're starting out in a new world. Um, so, um, I just have about a minute. Uh, the last issue is sort of uh, an important one. And when we talked to the states, we found them always, they always reported that, you know, we don't know what the feds are going to do. Um, we think we do. Uh, they've, in the Obama administration, there were certain memoranda written that sort of gave them permission to proceed. Um, and in the current administration, you know, as I say up here in the title, current federal position on marijuana is quite unclear. Oh boy, is that an understatement or what? Um, so, um, as I talked yesterday, and I won't get into all the detail, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty about what the feds might do. Um, the one thing I can say is they haven't done anything yet. Maybe that means something, maybe it doesn't. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a big unknown. I uh, said yesterday in a very short answer, I get asked a lot because of my years in DC, what do you think the Trump administration's gonna do? So I look at them and open my mouth and go, beats the out of me. And um, when we don't know. Uh, they, there's been a lot of references to enforcement and that they've been, you know, the feds will be enforcing the laws, but they really haven't done anything differently. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the Trump administration and what they might do, I'm gonna end with that, a, a quote from that great sage, Yogi Berra, um, and he, you know, in terms of forecasting, he said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So, uh, on that, I'm gonna, uh, before I turn it over to Rick, Just to let you know the plan, we, we don't know how much time we'll have for Q&A at the end because we had a few things at the beginning. They'll each go 15 minutes, but we do have a lunch and learn, the three of us. Uh, we'll have it'll be a, a much more opportunity for Q&A at that point, just to remind you that session, I think, is in Oxford upstairs. So that'll be uh, for the lunch this afternoon. So I'll now turn it over to Rick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to be with you today. Uh, I want to acknowledge two colleagues that are with me uh, here. Uh, Jane Rushford, who's the chair of the Lipper Cannabis Board. If you just stand, Jane. Um, thanks for joining us, Jane. Mary Sagawa is here, who um, eight years ago, uh, we hired Mary Sagawa as our public health education liaison. 
We actually stole it from a community-based prevention program in Thurston County, where we both live, where we all live, uh, called together. And she really serves as the link and the liaison between public health and prevention uh, for the Liquor and Cannabis Board, and I'm kind of proud to say that because a lot of the other ABCs or alcohol regulators do not have people in the agency who do that work. Also want to thank uh, not only the opportunity to speak with you today, uh, but to be with you yesterday. Um, I want to be clear that we understand the work that you do every day to keep our community safe. It's why the Liquor and Cannabis Board, before as a Liquor Control Board, we were created. Our mission is public safety. Our vision is safe communities. It's pretty consistent with the work that you do every day. And so, I have 15 minutes to give you a broad overview of the work that we've done in Washington implementing I-502. Some of the discussions we had yesterday kind of fit into this, but <clears throat> let me share with you, as a Liquor Control Board, and I can't believe, Lewis, it's been, it'll be five years in November since legalization occurred in Colorado and Washington. It feels like it's only been a couple of years, but uh, really I didn't even look at the initiative until about a month before it, it, it was approved by the voters. After that, we actually sat down with Allison Holcomb, who is the uh, policy director for ACLU in Washington, who authored the initiative to get some idea of what was the intent of the way that you wrote it. Because when I opened it for the first time and looked at it, it looked like the alcohol beverage law coming out of Prohibition in 1934. And she specifically, and while there's a lot of similarities between Alaska, Colorado, and Oregon, there are also some obvious differences. I'm gonna speak very clearly about that. A tightly controlled and regulated cannabis market. So she actually, Allison looked at, and we're the only state of the eight states for personal use that don't allow vertical integration. She went back to the alcohol beverage law from 1934 that separated the tiers. If I'm a producer and processor of cannabis, I can have no financial interest, direct or indirect, in a retailer. That goes back to the original alcohol beverage law coming out of Prohibition. Remember, before Prohibition, the largest distillers and the largest brewers did what? They controlled all the saloons. There was no competition. So coming out of Prohibition, they decided to write a three-tier tight house law that says, basically, there can be no interest. We must separate the tiers and put a distributor so that these retailers uh, will never have the control of the distillers. Now, ironically, we won't have enough time to talk about it. I can tell you how that's reversed. It's inverted now, where the retailer exercises a lot of control in the alcohol industry. But I won't get into that. But it did, she did create a tightly controlled system. It took two years to bring medical into the current legal system because it was what? As it is throughout the country, vertically integrated. I can produce, I can process, I can retail. But in order to create this tightly controlled system, and I think it was said yesterday, in order to gain votes, and part of the campaign was, we have to treat cannabis like alcohol coming out of prohibition. And so it created a three-tier regulatory system for cannabis, created licenses for producer, processor, and retailer. Uh, we have a large enforcement uh, presence at the Liquor and Cannabis Board, 150 enforcement officers, more now, with cannabis and we collect and distribute taxes and fees. One of the interesting things that we did, and it was said in uh, what John just shared with us, immediately we limited the number of licenses. Uh, we also limited the grows. Um, we basically said that if you're a producer, an entity, a company, uh, you can only have one producer license initially. If you're a retailer, you could only hold three retail license. The idea there, the intent, it was $250 to apply, $1,000 annual fee for licenses. In discussions with the author, the intent was to bring as many people into the illegal marketplace as possible. We even suggested at the time, why didn't you create a public monopoly like we had for alcohol? And she said, no, the idea was to bring the illegal market into the legal marketplace. And we had discussions yesterday about a for-profit model versus a state control model, the other models that you saw um, yesterday. Really, everything is established around the coal memorandum. So believe it or not, 
We waited nine months in Colorado and Washington to determine whether the feds were going to even allow us to move forward. We worked closely with the U.S. attorneys uh, in the western and eastern part of Washington to tell us, we're about ready to issue licenses. Are you going to allow us to move forward? All the regulations, at least in Washington, are really secured around the three first enforcement priorities. Preventing distribution to minors, preventing uh, the criminal element from controlling the licenses, and then trying to make sure there's no diversion out of the state of Washington or inversion of illegal product into the legal market in Washington. So just wanted to let you see, and if you go to our website, we, we have everything on our website with respect uh, to what we look like as far as an industry. Two thirds of the population in Washington lives, as you probably know, in the Puget Sound corridor. That's why you see the concentration of retail locations there. Eastern Washington, about 20% of the population lives there, uh, a big population in Spokane. But you'll see, maybe unlike Colorado, that the producer processor retail locations are dispersed uh, across the state. In fact, it's said that you won't drive more, typically more than, for 90% of the marketplace, more than eight minutes to get to a retail location. So we felt it was important to create as many outlets. But I will share with you, again, we used the old liquor control board model of a limited number of retail locations. We began with 324, which was interesting enough when we were selling spirits in Washington before the Costco initiative in 2011, that was exactly the number of retail locations we had for liquor stores. And so we used that same model. So I share sales activity and tax activity since we began. Um, three, three fiscal years of retail sales, almost 260 million in sales the first year, almost 800 million the second year, 1.37 billion this last fiscal year. We're averaging about 4 million uh, average daily sales. As you can see, the revenue, a 37% excise tax on cannabis at the retail level, a 7 to 10% retail sales tax, uh, depending upon uh, what city or county you're in. And then there's also a B&O, a business and occupation tax, that applies. The excise taxes that were collected, almost 65 million the first year, 185 million the second year, 314 million the third year. Just so you know, these were the projections that were initially made, um, and you can see uh, we really weren't sure what was going to happen because what was happening, and I'll speak about it in a moment, was there was a competition going on with the unregulated medical marketplace that had been in place since 1998. Where does the money go? And maybe one of the things that uh, Allison did very well was look at how would the monies be distributed. 50% of it actually pays for the basic health care plan uh, in Washington. The last fiscal year, 141 million. And then you see the Department of Health for Cannabis Education and Public Health Programs, Prevention and Reduction of Substance Abuse at DSHS. Uh, I think one of the things that's uh, really sad when we talk about, and I know there are folks here from the University of Washington, is the amount of money that has not gone into research. Uh, it was intended it would be a, a larger percentage for both University of Washington and WSU. In fact, in talking with some folks that are here from UW, what, what, they, what they originally intended to receive, you see 207000 for University of Washington, actually was intended to be over a million dollars. But you see on the very bottom, the general fund piece increase from 18%, which was intended in the initiative, to 33%, because like most states, we were struggling with a deficit in our budget, and they used cannabis money instead of providing it to the entities it was intended to through the initiative. Here's, here's some examples of some of the funded activities for the Department of Social and Health Services and the Department of Health. I'm not going to go into all of it, but obviously, uh, prevention, uh, abuse, prevention, treatment monies for not only cannabis but all drugs. We were talking yesterday about uh, the price per gram and it has fallen to the point about $7.32 uh, per gram in Washington and that's an average price. So you can buy marijuana in Washington for as little as 4 or $5 a gram. That's why we see such a huge increase in the last year with sales 
because what happened, believe it or not, is the price of cannabis in Washington is probably lower than it was when we had a black market and a gray market. And part of, part of that has to do with oversupply. It raises a big question that we posed even last year at a similar summit that we were at, is should we impose minimum pricing as they have in uh, Scandinavian countries for alcohol? Um, it's something that I think we should consider because the, the average price per gram continues to fall. In fact, I think it's cheaper to buy marijuana in Washington than it is in Idaho or in the other state, Oregon, and that's concerning uh, to us with respect to price. Um, we started about six months later than Colorado and actually saw a couple of incidents that occurred in Colorado that concerned us. And so when it came to edibles and infused products, the board adopted an emergency rule that said no edibles or infused products could be, in quote, especially appealing to children. Little did we know that in the black market, in the gray market, lollipops, gummy bears, uh, cotton candy was being sold, infused with marijuana. So anything with bright colors. We actually have a four-person committee at the board. Mary sits on that committee. Uh, that looks at all packaging, all labeling, and all product around edibles and infused products to make sure that they're not available. Something else we learned with the Department of Agriculture, because I heard someone talking about refrigerated items. Department of Ag suggested to us do not allow for high-risk foods, only allow low-risk foods to be sold as edibles and infused products. I didn't know uh, that that existed, but basically anything that has to be refrigerated or heated cannot be sold as an edible or an infused product in, in Washington State. I wanted to show you an example of um, a, a label that we have in our marketplace. We actually worked with the Washington State Poison Center for about nine months, uh, the board and staff did, to come up with a symbol that we could use, similar to Mr. Yuck, which is something that the board actually considered requiring on all packaging uh, and labeling for cannabis. But the Washington State uh, Poison Center came up with something we thought was appropriate, which is basically the red hand with not for kids. And it's basically in, in response to the increase that you saw in calls, not only in Washington and Colorado, but other states that have legalized in medical um, around emergency visits and calls uh, for kids who have consumed. How do we limit access? Obviously, you have to be 21 uh, to consume. Uh, recreational marijuana possession limits that you'll see in most of the states that have legalized the limit of production and retail stores in Washington. Basically, you know, our youth compliance rate in Washington for cannabis is higher than it is for alcohol. In alcohol, uh, somewhere between 84 and 92 percent youth compliance rate. The last two months in Washington, 98 percent youth compliance rate for cannabis. We do at least three visits a year to each retail cannabis location uh, in Washington. If you have, uh, if you are checked and you sell, we go back every six months until that changes or we suspend or cancel the license. Uh, and then different than all the other states, we don't allow home grows in Washington for recreational. And that's been a debate. Every legislative session where folks, usually from the city of Seattle and others are advocating uh, for home grows. We even have a provision that was written into a bill this session that has the board looking at whether we should allow for home grows for recreational. And the, and the position of the board uh, and those that have been involved in this has typically been why would you need to have home grows if you have a source for uh, obtaining recreational or personal use marijuana? It, it is allowed for medical but again, not for personal use, but that debate continued uh, to occur in our state. In our discussions with folks in Colorado and other states, they've told us it's nothing but a problem. In fact, I believe Colorado, and I learned here, reduced the amount of plants that can be grown uh, for home use, but uh, we continue to struggle, we continue to say, and they'll say, well, you allow for alcohol. No, no, you can't have it, you can't distill uh, spirits uh, at home, you can beer and wine, but I tell folks, you know, the alcohol beverage laws were written over 80 years ago. It was only in the last 20 years that you can uh, create or and, and make, produce your own wine and beer, which is limited. So we'll continue to struggle this, but 
we do believe that it's important to um, to not allow home girls for personal use. I'm out of time, so I'm just going to stop so that uh, we can take Q and A. Thank you. coffee out there. It kind of feels early in the morning to me. Uh, it, I want to just thank John for inviting me here today. John's been a really good mentor to me, both uh, uh, on some work that I'm doing on a doctoral program right now, but also um, he was uh, there for me to answer a lot of questions and get some uh, mentorship when I was actually leaving state government and starting uh, a company with a colleague of mine uh, earlier this year. So thank you very much, John, for, for having me here today. Um, as, as, as you heard when, when I first got introduced, uh, um, we're, we're, the company that I work for now is still really focused on government work. And so since we're so focused on government work, um, my feelings about marijuana legalization are best described as being agnostic on the, the concept of, of legalization. Uh, but what I will tell you is that I really think that uh, once the decision is made by an electorate or a legislature to move forward with some type of legalization, I think that it can be done really, really well. And getting it done and done well really has a lot to do with being, as a government group, being really open-minded to understanding how this process is going to evolve over time. John mentioned it from the PPIC report that was done in California, that you have to, that the, the, the regulations and the, the statutes that are surrounding this policy really need to have some flexibility in there because there's always some sort of unintended consequences that come around from uh, getting these all developed and implemented. So, so what I want to do is kind of use the balance of my time to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we faced here initially in Colorado uh, and, and then kind of use some of those challenges to, to better understand some of the lingering policy issues that are still out there today, even five years five years after uh, legalization happened, and, and I gotta tell you, it doesn't feel like five years. Uh, it feels more like two years, even though I think it took like 20 years off of my life uh, to, to go be amongst the first states to do all this. But, but having said that, I, I, I think that it's really important for us to understand some of the lingering issues because the version 1.0 that you see here in Colorado today, in Washington, in Alaska, and Oregon, that's, that's certainly served its purpose, but we really have to start thinking ahead now uh, to what version 2.0 is going to look like and, and what kind of changes that really need to occur for us uh, uh, to get to that point. So if I sound a little preachy when I get to that area, I apologize in advance. So, so let me just talk a little bit about first uh, the initial challenges here in Colorado. And some of it was unique to, to Colorado and Washington because we were amongst the first, but most of the challenges occurred because the policy can be very, very disruptive to government services. Uh, it's incredibly di divisive, and because it covers so many different uh, professional areas, uh, it can be really, really complex. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into some of the unresolved policy issues that still exist today. So um, the disruptive part, and I think most people that are going through this right now, whether it be Canada or Rhode Island or uh, California, one thing you can attest to is, is trying to implement this policy when it requires you to either create a new agency or to have an existing agency take in the responsibility of developing and implementing the policy. It can be very, very disruptive to government agencies in the jurisdiction that it's happening in. Uh, for example, here in Colorado, it, there were 10 departments that had to coordinate efforts to be able to really uh, um, effectively get policy uh, decided on and, and implemented here within the state of Colorado. Um, you're, if you're uh, starting a new agency you're, or you're, uh, 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 an existing agency is taking on this responsibility, you still need more resources. So you're hiring new people, and while you're hiring new people, you're getting new systems like seed to sale and records management up and running. Uh, you're trying to figure out where all those resources are going to come from. And all of this stuff is happening uh, all at the same time. And, and it's always happening in very, very tight time frames. Every time I hear the tight time frames that, that uh, Massachusetts is facing right now, uh, or California's facing, I get a little bit of PTSD uh, flare up because I remember those times. I remember working like almost night and day, going home and taking a quick shower so we can keep the, the ball moving uh, down the court. 
but, but that disruption, we cannot be underestimated. You gotta start thinking ahead, if you're looking at some implementation, how you're gonna deal with some of that disruption. So now on the divisive side of things, uh, one thing, uh, even if you look at Colorado where 55% of the vote, uh, uh, of the electorate voted for legalization in 2012. Well, 45% of the electorate said it was a bad idea and voted against it. And so you, as, as, a, as, a, as a government agency, you're starting out from uh, at, at the onset with about half of the people that say it's a great, fantastic idea, we want to give you guys the ball and run with it, the other half that says that it's really bad. And so the other thing too, that when it comes to divisive, you have the, the policy being divisive, people bring a lot of emotion to the policy making process. And when they bring a lot of emotion to the policy uh, process, um, interpretation of existing data is not always the most accurate, right? So, so it's, it's, if it's emotionally driven, a lot of times those things are, it's, it's really difficult for the government agency to really be able to kind of see through the noise to be able to better understand what's really the right policy balance. And of course, I talked a little bit about complexity. The complexity around marijuana legalization is uh, is is so much that we, we had kind of a saying that we had, no matter if we were doing press interviews or whatever the case might be, we always would say, hey, just so you know, this is gonna be harder than you think it's gonna be, it's gonna take a lot longer, and it's gonna cost more. So whether you're dealing with real uh, uh, troublesome uh, policy like banking or pesticides or testing or all those different kinds of things we're gonna talk a little bit more about later, um, you have to realize that that's really complex, and a lot of times the government agency that's the, that's, that's the key agency to implement policy, like a liquor control board, they're not they're not agriculturalists. They don't know anything about agricultural uh, practices. They may not know much about food manufacturing. They may know some about banking, but they don't know all the complexities around it. And so all of a sudden, you've got these agencies that kind of have to be experts in all areas, uh, and, and it can be a, a real challenge. So uh, if that wasn't dire enough to <laughs> get paint the picture, we got out of, we actually had a couple things that really worked in our advantage, and we think about these things all the time right now as we're traveling from state to state and looking at some of the, uh, of the work that they're trying to get accomplished. And so one of the reasons we had a real advantage is we had uh, before the election, we had almost, almost every elected official in the state of Colorado said that uh, Amendment 64, legalization of marijuana, was, was something they didn't support. After 55% of the electorate said, we, 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 we support this, everyone pivoted. And, they, and, and uh, you saw elected officials across the state really start to support the idea that we got to make sure we get this right, because the consequences of not getting it right um, are much worse than doing nothing at all. And so one of the lessons we learned, especially when it came to elected officials, is, is it's almost always better, I think, to do something. If you're, as an elected official, you're given this uh, task of taking this on. It's almost always better to do something rather than not do anything at all, uh, because that becomes, becomes problematic for other reasons. The second thing that we had going for us, and a lot of it uh, kind of trickled down from the notion that elected officials supported us, was the idea that all the appointed officials had to come together because, like I mentioned, uh, uh, health uh, department, uh, human services, department of transportation, agriculture, taxation, all those departments had to work together. They all had responsibility. And, and we had, um, partly because the governor created a director of marijuana uh, coordination position to help coordinate all those efforts, but we had the support of all the appointees coming together every two weeks to really work on uh, striking the right balance of policy. And then the third thing that we had going for us, and Governor Hickens really kind of cast the die for us on this, and that was to make sure that we brought together as diverse a uh, group to, uh, as we could possibly find uh, to do rulemaking around the most difficult issues. We had to, we had to limit how much production of uh, our, our cultivations were going to be able to uh, put out. We had, we had to, you know, um, get hundreds of licenses done. We had to talk about edibles manufacturing, all these other types of things. We just simply, as a government agency, we could not have done it without really focusing on getting a diverse group of, of, of industry people, law enforcement, elected officials, subject matter experts, so we could, so we could strike really well-balanced policy. And so if you think of those three things, support from elected officials, all the appointees and government heads coming together, and then this notion of really being engaged with the public to arrive at better policy, you really have a framework now where you can start to look at other jurisdictions and see to what extent they have those three things, 
And to the extent that they have those three things, we can kind of start to assess whether or not that initial launch is going to be uh, um, successful or smooth uh, or not. And so, uh, so we, we were really fortunate. The other thing, too, about that framework is that as you start looking at some of these other policy issues that are still, as of today, five years down the road, are largely unresolved, um, we, uh, um, uh, even though they're largely unresolved, you have like a, a framework by which to start to tackle those. So I've been talking about unresolved policy here for a little bit, so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, banking is a good example of this. DUIDs is another good example. Uh, we've got financial services for banks, other than just general banking services, but access to capital, those kinds of things. General testing, uh, pesticides, ethical issues, or um, uh, equity issues, those types of things. If you look at that laundry list of everything, you can you can you have to recognize that there's really two main causes to almost all of those. One is there's this federal disparity uh, uh, with state law, uh, and the other one is, is that the science, in a lot of ways, has not caught up with policy. So banking is still an issue largely because all of this that we're doing right now is still illegal at the federal level. And so uh, uh, pesticides testing, it's, it's really complex and it's still kind of troublesome because both scientifically, uh, we haven't proven that it's safe to apply certain pesticides to marijuana in certain, certain circumstances. Uh, so the science hasn't caught up with it, but the federal law also kind of makes it a little bit more challenging to uh, get all that done. DUIDs, DUIDs is a great example of the science has just simply not caught up to the policy of legalization. Uh, where there, are, there is some really good initial field expedient policy around the country trying to address the DUIDs, whether it's by mammograms, there still really is a need to be able to understand better how marijuana is in your body, how it actually uh, how much of it actually is per se impairment. We just simply don't know that. So, so looking forward, and as I mentioned before, if, if uh, it's true that the federal policy and that disparity is creating some issues with us being able to resolve certain policy, and the science isn't quite caught up with the policy yet, it makes sense then that version 2.0 of this uh, for uh, uh, other jurisdictions is that they start to focus on those two areas. I'm not trying to suggest at all that all the hard work that we put into 1.0 should be thrown and cast aside. That's not the case at all. What I would suggest is that actually acts as a launching pad for emerging regulatory marketplaces to be able to utilize and gain some efficiencies on the front end so then they can kind of start to deal with some of the, the other things. So, so 2.0, first and foremost is probably going to need to have some form of federal clarity. And, and, what, and we really argue that um, from, from our perspective right now that there's, there's a real need for uh, agencies and research institutions and peripheral businesses to actually kind of come together and coalesce around the idea of getting uh, clarity at the federal level, both so that they know that they're not subject, they're not going to be subject to criminal prosecution, but also that they're not going to be uh, losing potential investment that they're going to be putting in the, into the industry, whether it be money or, or resources. That, that that federal clarity piece is really, really important, and, and it, it needs to come from someone other than just industry. Not that the industry doesn't have a valid voice in this, it just we need it to be from a, from a much bigger group. And then uh, um, other things, 2.0 uh, are important. We really think that it's important for uh, there to be a better analysis of the data that we have. So in Colorado, we have this really great, robust seed to sale tracking system. You see the same systems or systems like that across the country, and they get all sorts of really good data. Uh, I mean, literally millions and millions of transactions. And what we did really good on the front end at 1.0 is we created those systems to collect that data. What I don't think we've uh, done as well or needs more work is the ability for us to really be able to not only analyze that data, but to be able to get data from multiple res uh, sources like tax data, um, crime data, seed to sale tracking data, and really start to better understand whether or not our licensees using that data or whether our licensees are compliant, but also start to provide some tools for some of those peripheral businesses like banks and insurance companies so they can start to provide some of the professional services that are really needed to take the, the, the credibility of the industry up to the next level. So with that, um, I will uh, uh, look forward to some of the questions that you all have. And again, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, be here.